That's right. You got to trust the data enough to give it a really good try, exactly as you described. And then what's important is what's it doing for you? Not just for your outcome, not just for your product, but your process. What is it doing for you? You feel up, up there with what you're doing. What is up, guys? It's your host, Robbie Roland, and I can't even begin to explain how excited I am to be able to put a headset on, adjust this little mic thing next to my lips and just talk to you guys because it's truly something that I enjoy doing. Um, I think for a while there, I got pretty stressed out with having like four episodes uh, being recorded a week while trying to train and trying to heal from a lat injury. And there's just a lot of things going on in my life that I was actually getting to a point where the podcast was more just stressful than anything. And um, so I'm back to a point in my life right now where I I look forward to doing this. And um, I want to apologize for the lack of true authenticity from my end, I think, these last few weeks from the show. Uh, I just poured my heart out to you guys, so I hope you didn't just get disgusted and double-click your phone and swipe up on this podcast app, and that means you closed the tab. Anyways, um, what am I saying? All right, we have a super awesome, super-duper awesome episode for you guys today. Episode 38, Dr. Peter Fatty. I was introduced to him actually in May of this year. Uh, I think for most of my listeners know, I was in Southern Illinois. I was a minor at the the beginning parts of this year. Uh, That's the independent baseball team in Marion, Illinois for the Frontier League. Uh, And um, Peter and I were introduced because he came and gave us a presentation on really what uh, he talks about here in the show. I don't want to give too much away uh, in the introduction, but uh, was just super like in complete awe of what he was talking about and correlating it to the baseball realm. Because I think for most of you know, like I totally geek out when it comes to mindsets and state of minds that you have to be in to succeed or how to optimize your brain functionality um, while performing, and how to really just train your brain to act accordingly uh, in in high pressure situations. So, like I said, I geek out about this stuff. I hope you haven't checked out on me yet, but this is uh, this is just another one of those tools that we all as as athletes can utilize uh, to better ourselves, to better our performance uh, when it really matters, right, in in crunch time. Uh, So this is going to be a podcast mostly directed towards baseball players, pitchers, hitters alike, softball for sure. But I also think it correlates to athletics in general because we talk – about a lot of visualization stuff. And uh, like I said earlier, we talk about how to really optimize the brain and the mind to better your performance. So to me, that kind of, you know, goes into a lot of sports, not just baseball or softball. But uh, yeah, so episode 38, I will be released. Yeah, so I'll just release this right away. So I don't have to think about what date it is or whatever. But I do want to take this time and talk about the sponsor of this show. Uh, We actually agreed to do a month-long sponsorship with Pocket Radar. Now, if you are unfamiliar with Pocket Radar, this was... This is the radar that I actually use in almost every Instagram video that I post, which has a speed on it. And it's funny because this is something that I want to actually 
uh, I want to plug them initially, but I also want to talk about how the advancements in their radar gun has made drastic improvements because if you guys have followed me on Instagram for a while, you have seen particular posts that I've made that I've had the camera right behind, strategically placed behind the, the pocket radar with the me and then the catcher or whoever I'm throwing to. And the reason I bring this up, because I've always had to make sure that the, the, the radar gun was in the, the shot so everyone that's watching the video can see the speed, right? And it goes the same for hitters. They need to see the speed. But now they created what is called the Smart Coach Radar. And it's the first standalone accurate radar gun that can also be used with an app. This app is absolutely free, no monthly subscription required, but it's also you're allowed to display the speed on the screen in bright red LED and it's announced via speaker on the iPad or iPhone and uh, the Android app actually it will be available soon. They wanted they wanted uh, me to definitely say that. Uh, but it's uh, so how cool is that, right? So it, it it syncs up with an app, and then you can just film yourself. You don't have to worry about getting the gun, the radar in the screen. So you can film, and then it just automatically syncs up with the video. And uh, I think that's like the coolest thing. I cannot wait to get healthy, to be able to use this thing and and definitely display it on my um, my Instagram. Uh, but the uh, the app also allows you to track your data over time, uh, which is which is great, right? Because it allows us to track our progress with that, whether it be softball, baseball, hitting, pitching. It uh, it doesn't really matter. So I, like I said, I'm super excited to be able to use this and, um, I want to thank them for, for sponsoring this show. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there's that. And I will also want to say, I know this is a long introduction. I apologize. Um, but I want to reiterate that everything you hear in this episode will be linked in the show notes. Whether it be a book we talked about, whether it be a website we talked about, um, I don't think we talked about any articles. But if we did, I will link those as well. So the show notes, all you have to do is click see details on the app that you're listening to it on, and it will bring down, and the links are right in there that you can click. There's a couple books that we mentioned that I am definitely going to purchase because I, again, it's I, all comes down to like these little minute details to get the edge in performance, right? I mean, that's what we all seek for. That's why you're listening to this podcast. I know you're not listening to it because my lovely voice, you're listening to it to better yourself as an athlete or as an individual. So these are another, these are just all tools to, to, to put in your toolbox to utilize. Anyways, I uh, want to appreciate what? I want to express my appreciation towards you for being a subscriber. And if you're not a subscriber, please hit that subscribe button. Tell your friends that there's a psycho dude who um, keeps talking and thinking he's smart, but he's not, that you should go listen to him. I Okay, I'm talking way too much now. So episode 38, The Robbie Rose Show, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, trying to get Spotify. Spotify is being tough. You can listen to it all of them. You can follow Dr. Fatty on Twitter, at Dr. Fatty. And uh, he wanted me to, I think he says it in the show, but he wants for you to search hashtag pitch recognition. And he's posting a lot of good stuff using that hashtag that you guys can check out. Anyways, Again, that was my longest introduction ever. Thank you to Pocket Radar. Thank you to Dr. Peter Fatty for coming on, for making this show possible. And thank you for you guys for giving me an outlet, I guess, to talk about. I don't know. And yeah, I got to get to the episode. Guys, thanks again. This is Robbie Rowan, your host. Follow me on Instagram at RobbieRowe12. That's Robbie with a Y. Without further ado, here's today's episode 38 with Dr. Peter Fatty. Let's get to it. 
All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 38 of The Robbie Rowe Show. Um, I have a special guest for you guys today. Peter Fatty um, is a professor and director. I'm going to give a brief introduction, and Peter, let me know if I, I, I just don't do it justice because I know you're a very intelligent guy. So I just want to briefly touch on professor and director of the Learning Systems Design and Technology Graduate Program at Southern Illinois University. Um, Peter, welcome to the show. How are we doing today? Thanks, Robbie. Doing great. Good. So, did I, so, so was that? Did that do its justice, or, or should we should we dive into to a little bit more of your of your background as far as um, you know, just briefly glancing over your page and being introduced to each other. So you said that was in May, right? You you came to Southern Illinois in May and talked to the, us for the miners, right? With the miners, but I've been working with the miners uh, several years now, uh, getting the video for our pitch recognition app, and just starting with some research down there. And Mike Pinto is really open to new ideas and things like that. So I mean, that's that's great. You know, we've right. got a Frontier League team right there, fell right into place with what we were working on. Okay. Uh, I, so, so my question to you, so I want to dive into this a little bit, just from what Mike has kind of told me briefly about you was, um, it was this always a passion of yours? Like what, what kind of, what kind of brought you into that realm of the whole, uh, I don't know what, what word to put it into a sense, but like that, that brain, um, functioning into the sports world. Well, really, it was through video. So I was working at uh, Purdue University as the video coordinator, athletic video coordinator. So primarily working with football, not highlights type of stuff, but uh, helping the coaches prepare, uh, you know, self scout and then preparing for opponents and and uh, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so and and also just taking one class at a time because I was at a university. My wife teaches and runs a graduate program at, at Purdue. Mm-hmm. So you know over. I don't know if I'm proud or embarrassed to say it, but over like 13 years, you know, one piece at a time, old Johnny Cash song, yeah. I finally get to where I've got to do a dissertation research project and started looking and saying, okay, I'm in this sports realm. And, you know, wh- where, how can you put video and data together uh, for player learning, player performance, not just for like game analysis, for coaches breakdown? Um, which is kind of where the sabermetrics is going now. That's like the leading edge of that, where they're, you know, you've got the, the Astros actually influencing guys' um, spin rates and, and pitch selection and sequencing and you know, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, they're doing a lot of that. Um, so you know, that, I started looking at that, and as I did so, um, I kind of discovered this area of sports psychology – they call sports expertise research. And it was really done a lot in the early 80s in Australia and has continued to be done. That's kind of the center of it. Mm -hmm. But they're looking at return of serve in tennis or goalie in hockey or soccer, or of course, hitting in cricket, you know, their cricket and um, baseball. Right. These things where people are doing what seem like just impossibly fast reactions and yet you look at the best, you know, you look at an Albert Pujols and it's like he's got all the time in the world. It's just putting the bat on the ball. You right. know? They're making it look so easy. How does that happen when we know that not only is it hard, but it really it shouldn't even be possible. Like hitting the kind of stuff that you guys throw, that high level pitchers throw, <laughs> it, you know, the, nobody should ever hit over 100. Oh, yeah. It's all a complete workaround. It's all this kind of like mental trickery that you, you have, you know, little mental workarounds just to be able to, to get bat to ball. Uh, but anyway, you know, they, they used this method in their lab. They call it video occlusion. So occlusion is always cutting something off. So if you have, if you have any weightlifters, you know, they'll, they'll put a band an occlusion band around their arm, and then it, you know, everything's got to work to make the blood flow more. Yeah, while blood flow restricted training. Yeah, right. So anytime you restrict one thing, you're making something work harder. Right. But anyway, that's how they used to measure, kind of break down and measure this kind of, uh, uh, you know, expert ability to to recognize these things early. And so I thought, well, if that's how they research it, then that's we can use that for training. Um, so started working just on taking that same research method where they're showing a, a video, in this case, a picture right. from a batter's point of view, and it's cut off. 
You know, you see the ball a couple of feet out of hand, it's cut off. You know, what's the pitch type, ball or strike? And, uh, you know, the ex the experts were better at guessing what that is. And so just like anything else, you, you start off with something people can do and then you can add kind of progressive difficulty and you can you can get guys to where they're calling that pitch right out of hand. Yeah. To, so to me, like the first thing that comes to my mind is like a comfort factor, right? Because I feel like, uh, and I know I think I asked you this when you gave the presentation with the minors, is like, the more times you see something, I think your brain starts getting a sense of comfort, which allows your body to kind of get into a state of relaxation. Is that kind of what we're targeting here within the really all this 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 video work? Absolutely. The the idea <laughs> is that you're doing that that uh, day in day out kind of work so that your 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 body, your mind, your eyes can all work together without thinking about it. So sometimes people want to say, hey, the last thing I want is a pitcher, is a hitter thinking up there. You know, I don't want paralysis by analysis. Right. But we don't want to mistake, we don't want to mistake not thinking for thinking so well that it feels like <coughs> thinking. Those are two really different things. That's too much thinking. <laughs> yeah. So we, we want, we want to, we want to be able to practice and woodshed those things in, in a real uh, safe, comfortable, you know, controlled environment. And then just let it go, you know, you know, go to that flow state when you're out there performing in it. So it's it's uh, it's it's some real purposeful practice so that you can have some real intuitive performance. Well, yeah, I think I think it's a it's interesting dynamic, right? Because we as uh, especially in today's day and age with, you know, I talk a lot about on my show in regards to baseball players and the evolution of, of strength training, right? Like, I mean, you know, 15 years ago, you didn't see the type of builds that you see in today's game. And that's obviously a compliment to strength training and the importance of that. But now when you get into this essentially virtual, virtual reality sense, it's, you try to rely on the, the physical capacities of the body, right. And kind of uh, give your brain like, uh, relaxation because obviously when you're when you're actually in the moment and uh and you're out there under the lights like you, the natural response is to think a lot and i think with what what we're talking about here you know for the audience is trying to get out of that that sense of thought and just rely on you know action and and the body and uh you know i think we we often overlook the the physical capabilities of the body and um you know just all the practice that goes into it but now it's funny because now we're talking about the practice that's going into the neurological side too so um if you can doc uh paint like a picture for the audience as far as what that looks like now uh is it it's a screen that we're kind of just looking at and uh, just seeing the same things over and over again if we're say we're a hitter right so this um, this Game Sense app, you could have it on your phone or your iPad or on a computer like this or on a big screen TV, mm -hmm. um, and you're just seeing a batter's view of a pitcher throwing a pitch, and we record all of them are pitches thrown in anger. You know, so it's not just bullpen sessions; these are pitches, real pitches thrown by real pitchers and competition right. in real counts. And, uh, and then really the task is just to, it, it'll, it'll show you at, at first it starts showing you about a third of ball flight. That's kind of like the basic training one. Mm -hmm. And you get to where you can be at 70, 80% guessing what the pitch type is and ball or strike. And then your reward is you get less ball flight. You know, now, now you're down to getting about six feet out of hand mm -hmm. and then you try and master that. And we've got, we've got all kinds of different pitchers in there. What you kind of would get a kick out of this, I, I sent you some of your video, but I didn't do what, what we do with the pitchers when we put them on the app is we'll flip them. So we double up the number of pitchers. So if you've ever wondered what you look like as a left hander, uh, yeah. see, we'll be able to, we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see that. Uh, and guys, you know, so, so that's really training. That's that skill acquisition phase. And then, you know, if we're working with high level teams, then we start working with, like with the minors this summer. Um, with video of the opponents that they'll face. Uh, but then that becomes a different thing. There's a difference between the skill acquisition stage and then kind of the opponent preparation type of stage. So like you say, it just becomes like a, um, like a visual perceptual weight lift, but it's really targeted. 
like it, it might go back a while before your time probably, but there was a shortstop that came up with the Red Sox a while ago, Garcia Pera. <laughs> Not really before my time. Guy. Come on now. <laughs> uh, you know, very, very, very thin guy, but really strong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was a he was a 30 plus home running uh, uh, a year guy. And he was really known to have brought in core training. He said, you know, you, that's how you hit a baseball. So he was really precise. So before people had been doing weightlifting, of course, all the standard sort of things. But he was saying, here is a a, a type of weightlifting that really goes with with swinging the bat. Yeah. And so, you know, people could do a lot of type of video training and people will, will do things like that. But we're saying, okay, here's here's a piece of video training that really goes with swinging the bat and making contact, uh, being able to get that early recognition. I mean, in last night's game, and I don't want to date the podcast too much, but it was the first game of the um, AL Championship Series. So right. it's the Astros and the Red Sox, both of whom are really known to train you know, pitch recognition and, and plate discipline. And, uh, you know, between the two of them, they did not bite, I don't think, on a single slider um, out of the zone that, you know, started in the zone and went out. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have a lot of mental discipline. You've really got to work that in there. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to not swing at that pitch because it sure looks like a strike coming in. That's what you're trying to do to him as a pitcher, right? Yeah. I'm going to show you something that looks like it's thigh high down the middle, but that's not where it's going to end up. So if you don't, you know, you, you pick up something early on and uh, that tells your brain, okay, don't fire. Yeah, especially with the guys that went last night too, right? I mean, we're talking about Sale and Verlander. I mean, that's no easy task. <laughs> right. And so they didn't get a lot of hits off of those guys, but they ended up, they you know, both side, it ended up being kind of a sloppy game, you know, a lot of walks and hit batsmen and all kinds of stuff. Sure. And these are with super precise pitchers. So you kind of swing it back a little bit. You know, you can swing swing the the, the uh, table back your way a little bit because you're going to say, I'm not going to bite at your at your sucker pitch. I mean, I know what I know what that is. I know that on on a two strike, you're going to throw that 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 uh, breaker that looks like it's a strike coming in and it's not going to be. So I'm going to have the nerve to not swing at it. Well, you got to train that up. That's not your natural instinct at all. You're training to overcome your natural instinct, kind of turn it into a new instinct. Well, yeah. And that's, that's the, right. When you said that, like, that's the fascinating part too. Cause especially like when a hitters down an account, right? Like your natural instinct is to not strike out looking, right? So then you get into protection mode and you want to, you want to get the bat off your shoulder. Um, so you're going against really, you know, what it is. But for, for me, I, I, I think like, you know, so what is it? I mean, what is like the grand scheme? Is it is it just like what we kind of said in the beginning of the show, like getting comfortable, or is it the the hitter kind of depicting something out of the actual biomechanics of the individual pitching that says, "Oh, that's slider," or "Oh, that's that's fastball." Like, what is it exactly? If you can kind of like pinpoint, um, you know, why the the hitters kind of get a better sense for what's coming. Well, you don't really see exact things you see some some kind of hints right um so you know you may you 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 may pick something up but it's kind of hard to talk about it because that kind of makes it disappear sure um so you know some some guys will pick up like a skinny wrist or something like that you know so so when uh when roger clemens started throwing the split late in his career um he he called it his fat wrist breaking ball Uh meaning that he knows exactly what you as a hitter are looking for you're looking for a skinny wrist you know, and, and that's something you can kind of see, you know, it's, it, you, you get a, you can sense it. You don't really see it, but you sense it because, you know, that pitcher's 20 yards away and his arms going through at 90 sure. miles an hour. So you don't really see something, but you can sense it. Oh, that was a, a skinny wrist or, or, um, uh, the, um, uh, Boggs, I, I read his book at some point, cause at some point I went to the, the hall of fame there in, in Cooperstown, right. I went to the, the A. Bartlett Giamatti Library and read every hitting book ever put out. So it's kind of <laughs> cool because you know how when you were a kid you'd put those little stickers, you know, this book belongs to Robbie. Yeah. Thing yeah. in there. Well, I'm reading one and it's like the nineteen, um, the nineteen sixteen Spalding hitting book um, by Rogers Hornsby, and inside that there's a little one of those little sheets that said, you know, this this book belongs to Roger. That's awesome. <laughs> Rogers <laughs> Hornsby. So. You know, that was pretty cool. Sure. Um, but, you know, just looking for any hints that they would say. And and uh, in, in Boggs' one, he said that 
he could feel his eyes bob in his head, and that's how he knew he had the hittable breaking ball. You know, that's he crazy. didn't say I saw it pop up. He didn't even say he saw. He he's he's saying something that he learned to recognize as a physical cue. He'd feel his eyes bob in his head, and that was the pop up curve that was you know the hanger, the the one that was going to come down. Yeah, well, I think it's just so fascinating because for me, you know, I think everyone's going to have a different kind of perception as far as you know this goes. But to me, it's kind of the the the, va- the similarities between like the flow state too is because when you when you sit here with a mic and you try to best of your ability describe it, it's it's hard, right? Like you can't just describe like these similarities and these things that actually occur. It just does occur. Um, which I think is completely fascinating. I want to touch on before we kind of move on is um, do you kind of see dangers um, when, you know, you, you, you try to incorporate this into like a, a college where you're dealing with younger guys? Because I know for me, if you were to give me like this kind of technology at like 18, 19 years old, and I were to look at this, you know, I would, I would overthink it. I would uh, I would try to like pinpoint every little mishap, and I would I try to dive in a little bit too deep, and therefore when I would get out onto the field, um, I think I'd be doing like the exact opposite of what the training was for, right? So, um, you know, almost getting in the box and thinking too much, like okay, I know that if he does this, that that's coming, or if I know he does this, that's coming. Um, do you kind of see the danger in that as well, or or no? Oh, sure. It's a it's a, a danger with that. We started with a pro team where we were doing this training. And usually you think, okay, you're going to do this in off season and you're kind of going to get a lot of reps and you're going to get to that that system one state. You know, we can talk about the system one, system two. You know, system one is very fast and automatic and unconscious. System two is the kind of the grinded analytical state. Okay. Uh, and so usually you want to work your way up to it. And they like started right when these guys were going out to their short seasons. Those rookie guys. So a lot of them were 18, 19, mm-hmm. and a lot of them Latin and, and like this. And I thought, wow, I hope we don't like seize people up kind of like what you're talking about. Right. And it turned out to not be any problem. I mean, I was the only one worried about it. <laughs> so, you know, they were going out and they they were, it was required. They were supposed to do, and they would just do a handful of these things. These are just these little drills and they would do two, three, four of them, you know, about, um, uh, about seven, seven minutes, seven to 10 minutes worth, you know, like uh, on home, somewhere in their preparation could be hours before a game, but they were also playing every night. Sure. So, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where you want, you, you want to do it enough that you push it into that system one area. So I, I you know, that, that I find that to be a really useful way of thinking about it, which is this system one, system two. So system one's your fast, automatic, instinctual, and system two is your rational and purposeful. And so what you want to do is you want to, in system two, that's where you're going to do your practice. So your thinking goes into how do we set this up so that it's working our eyes and our brain the way that we want them to. And if you set that up, you don't have to make your eye, just like in the weight room, you don't have to think about how your muscle regeneration is working. If you set it up right, mm-hmm. then just doing it will get you what you want. Almost just, trusting. It's like a trust, trusting. Right? Absolutely yeah. trusting it. You just trust that, that this has been properly designed. And if you just do this a lot, regularly, um, it's going to get you what you want. It's going to build that up. So you don't really have to grind it like that. Right. Uh, you can kind of just, you can just kind of do it and you do it and you'll get better. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's what you're aiming at. It's not a one shot thing. It's not like, Oh, I'm going to go to a workshop and somebody's going to show me this thing and then I'll know how to do it. I mean, you're going to have to, it's just like in the weight room, going out and doing something once in the weight room doesn't do anything for you except make you sore probably. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, for, for me, it's, it's tr- like, it's funny, dude, because the, the last guest that I had on my show was more into like the nutritional side and like decoding like genetic DNA and how to optimize that through, you know, how you live your life. And, and he was kind of saying the exact same thing. And that's why I love doing these, man, because it's fascinating how it all kind of, it, it, it correlates into each facet of life. Like we're talking sports here and, and just trusting what the, the science and what the data is showing us um, and, and putting that into our work, right? Because that's life in general where sometimes we do the right things and we don't see the results. But I think it goes beyond that and, and it goes into 
being somebody that can say, okay, this is what the data is showing me. I'm just going to trust it. And then, you know, kind of it's, it goes back to the, the cliche of trusting the process, right? Like just kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's exact. I mean, I, I was listening to one of your early shows. Uh, I think it was with, um, with the guy from, from baseball rebellion. Okay. Uh, yeah. JK. Yeah. And, um, you know, you were just saying it, it really is all about, putting together what your program is going to be. So you want to be thoughtful and check the best things on that and then just doing it until it feels weird. If you don't do it. Uh huh. Uh, and you know, that that's what we're after. So, you know, it's the idea of taking this, this app and you're just working that one piece of things. Now, what you want to do is you also want to be then standing in against pitchers okay. um, and uh, doing some batting cage things where we, that that worked the other end of it. So you're not going from, oh, I'm going from iPhone or or computer to the batter's box in a game. We want some in-between steps in there. You want to stand in against pitchers and, and not try and call the type of pitch or anything, but just call, you know, yes for fastball, no for not a fastball. And so we have a lot of the college teams that do that. And actually the pitchers like it because if you're out there and every time you throw your change up, the batter is yelling no before it's even out of your hand. It's, <laughs> it's some pretty Well, that's bit. that's what I saw when you sent me the video, right, of of me. Like, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've watched that. And it's only like a minute clip. But um, trying to essentially decode um, what was coming out of my hand, right? Because, I mean, obviously we're talking a lot as far as uh, the hitter side of things and how a hitter can – greatly benefit from this but for me as a pitcher like i'm sitting here watching my video from you know the right-hander box to the left-hander box and shoot like i'm seeing things that i didn't know hitters could see right and i mean that's pretty (laughs) much the same angle um so it greatly benefits the pitchers as well cool plus there's still that one league left where if you ever make that league you do have to hit (laughs) <laughs> hey, I got one AB in my career, man. I hit a freaking seed up the middle, but it was right to the second baseman. So that's 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 a story for another time. But we'll. <laughs> um, but so you're all right. So I, first, I want to say, is this because I know my listeners go, okay, it's an app. Now, mm-hmm. can they get this app like right now on their phones? Right. So if I can put in a plug, what they want to do is go to. GameSenseSports.com. I will so put this on the show thing. notes too. All right. GameSenseSports.com. Now, if you don't put the sports at the end of it, you go to a nefarious Russian gambling site. So, yeah, we'll, we'll you know, go you, to you that might later. not want that in your, in your history. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're with a ball team. But you go, you go to that and, you know, there's a baseball side, there's a softball side, there's a youth side and a pro side. And, um, uh, you know, you can, you can get it. Uh, as a, just an individual thing to work with or teams get it and then all their all their players are logging into it um, or facilities uh, like a, like like baseball rebellion can get something like that and then people can do it at the facility kind of the pro version and then they have a, a home version too so it's uh, you know it's, uh, I was surprised with it working on the iPhone because I was like uh, no you know you need a bigger thing here but uh, maybe it's old eyes or something <laughs> So people can go to their iPhones and and go to this and 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 get the app on their iPhone. Yeah, you can right you can download it from App Store for free. Now you're not going to be able to do anything with it unless you've got your login. So you got to have have a subscription for the login. Okay, so and it's like fifteen dollars a month or something for like an individual. It's not like a big knockout kind of thing. I like it being a, a subscription rather than something you've got to buy into, like buy a you know a new type of equipment or something like that, because hey, if you end up not using it or it's not working for you, hey, just quit paying for it. Well here here's the thing, man, is like I think it's so fascinating because no one's talking about this. Right? Like I mean we're so we're so um we're so fancied by like data analytics in today's game. And so we see a game on MLB network or ESPN. And every time there's a home run, we see Statcast, right? And we see like all this data driven things, but this is a, this is pretty much right up there with importance. I mean, in, in, in my opinion. Um, so I think for, for people to understand like how, how can you be great? Right, it's a culmination of all these tools that we have handy and, and utilizing them. So, you know, for for me, yeah, I, it's, I, it's nothing new, Robbie. I mean, you know, we're talking about the Red Sox when 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 uh, 
Ted, Ted Williams came up from San Diego, you know, 18 year old um, call up. Uh, so they, he would bug everybody about hitting. And actually, his first manager was this Rogers Hornsby who I'd mentioned. Right. And so this quote is often attributed to Ted Williams, but actually, it's what Hornsby said to him, which is the most th- most important thing I can tell you is get a good pitch to hit. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. So what's changed? No, you've got to know what's your pitch to hit. You know, your pitch to hit, your good pitch to hit might not be the same as my good pitch to hit. It may or may not be a strike. It's not necessarily the same thing as a strike zone. But knowing that, knowing yourself, recognizing it early enough so that you can make that adjustment, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can knock that outside slider, especially got a little pesky pull, you can wrap it around. You know, you can do something with that pitch if you recognize it early enough. So it's not all just, oh, I'm going to be picky up there. Some people think, oh, this pitch recognition that goes along with plate discipline, you're going to draw more walks and that kind of thing. That's, that's not necessarily what it is. It's certainly not the way the Astros use it. I mean, this, it, you can really be a hunter with that and yet not a chaser. I mean, you're your goal is to be a hunter and not a chaser. Yeah. Well, I, th- I, 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 I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to always go back to like flow state and I think we are mm-hmm. at our optimal when we're in that state of mind. And I think for me and in, in developing a routine or a training, you know, habit or whatever it is, it's how quickly can I get into that state, right? When I'm on the mound and the lights come on and there's people watching, like how quickly can I get into that state of mind where, you know, I do the Kevin Costner, clear the mechanism and I'm tunnel vision focusing in on the glove, you know, and it goes back to what we initially said in this podcast was it's a comfort factor, right? So if now if I can, um, if I can watch video of like the hitter, right. And just watching his load, watching how he takes pitches, watching how he, he does swing. And if I can get that sense of comfort within my brain and my body, then as soon as I tow it up that night, it's like I'm almost I'm almost already done it, visu- uh, you know, mentally and visually. We talk about visualization and how to use that as a tool for a means to you know improve. Uh, I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand. Now, do you see pitchers using it for that as well? That was another question I wanted to ask. Was are are you filming like hitters um, from the back or anything? No, that would be an interesting thing to do, you know, see how they react to something. Because yeah. you, know, you always read about the really master pitchers that they would watch. I guess they've thrown the pitch after the pitch is out of your hand. They're watching the batter and they see how the batter reacts to that pitch. Even yeah. if they took the pitch, for instance, sure. like, how did they take it? And that, that tells them something. So there's a whole process going on there all the time. That would be uh, very think- interesting, I think, because... Um, that's kind of how I utilize game film is, is, you know, even if it's not me, if it's just another right-handed pitcher, right. Kind of with the same similarities, same pitching tactics or whatever, I'm trying to see how the hitter is responding to certain sequences and responding to certain, uh, locations, right. So it kind of gives me a better sense for how to attack. Well, there are a number of of the pro clubs now who have these batters view cameras. So if you know where to look for them, you can see them there in Yankee stadium sure. in minute Maid field. Um, the pirates have it, the uh, brewers have it, the Phillies, ha- you know, where you, you can see those. And I would certainly hope that the pitchers use those really regularly also uh, not, you know, to, cause you can see a batter up there. And so you're really seeing, okay, how do those guys react to the, uh, to the pitches? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's all interesting stuff. So like I said, uh, just to reiterate, I will, um, link all that stuff like within the show notes and I'll do, I'll do the best of my ability to, to make sure that all my listeners kind of know where to go. And if they have any questions, um, you know, I'll direct them in, in some way, shape or form. But, um, you said you can go to the app store and download, Game Sense, or what is the app actually called? Yeah, it would you would go to Game Sense Sports, or you would go to it, the actual product is called Pitch IQ, um, and you can download it for free, but you're not going to be able to use it unless you go in onto the website and and get a, a subscription. Then you get your your yeah. login, all that kind of stuff. Um, so 
I gotcha. You know, you can do that as an individual, or if if teams do it, then you know all you have to do is they they they'll give you a login. Boom, you you know you log in and use it. It's really great on an iPad. That's how, that's how I like to use it best. I got gotcha. you. Can pass it around on the bus and that kind of thing, especially with all. It's kind of funny because as much as people practice, especially in baseball, probably more than any other sport, there are also these dead times. Oh, so if you can find something that just fits in there. What can I do in five minutes to make me better? And it's not Instagram. (laughs) It's not scrolling Twitter. (laughs) Hey, there was something that there was there's something I've just been reading that I really had you in mind when I was reading this. This is a a book that my colleague Len Zakowski, long known um, uh, sports psychologist, he's worked with the Celtics and he was sports science director for the Canucks and and this sort of thing. And he wrote a book called The Playmaker's Advantage. It's it's on uh, Derek Jeter's uh, publishing uh, company. Okay, and he talks in there. Um, about a, a guy named named Christian Swan. So that's that's the name you want to remember. We're talking about flow versus clutch because we talk about flow all the time. Oh, flow yeah. versus clutch. Like flow is letting it happen. So you kind of those conditions arise, and then you hope that it you know that you somehow get in that state. Whereas clutch is making it happen. It's much more pur- purposeful, where you can kind of drive it. And uh, so I thought you would get a kick out. He says you can't be in both at the same time, but you can kind of use your clutch state to set up your your flow state, still recognizing that that's where the magic happens and you can't control it. You well, let that happen, but you can set it up in your in your clutch. That's uh, so. First of all, I'm getting that um, somehow. I'm going to get that. Second of all, um, I so this is I geek out about this stuff as you know, but like I. I have a trouble when it comes to flow because of uh, the importance of getting into it, if that makes sense. Like I know that I need to essentially get into that state of mind. And I think knowing that I need to do it puts more of a stress on the importance of it, therefore like prohibiting me from getting in that state. Um, right, right. So that's how, the irony. How, that's the really that that's the kind of uh, wicked irony of it. Sure. Here, so, me, so how, me, how, how do we actually something from the book? See if you like this. Okay. This is from Len's book, uh, but he's quoting this Swan. Uh, clutch states share a core of similarities with flow, but are more effortful, deliberate, consciously controlled, and intense. In this state, athletes are much more aware of the importance of the situation, what's at stake, the consequences. And what's required to succeed. So you know that's where that's where you're 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 conscious. You're driving from that, and then you have to have so much control over yourself that you can use that to put yourself into this kind of natural flow state. Not easy thing to not an easy thing to do at all. Well, yeah, I almost think it does the opposite because, like, what you kind of just read that passage is like knowing what's at stake, knowing the importance, and then going into a different reality in your mind. Right. Like I, to me, that's almost like it's like being, um, you know, being an 18 year old kid first getting drafted and then the team saying, oh, hey, you have game one of the World Series. And it's like you have this substantial amount of pressure and you probably are not yourself. So how as athletes, let me ask you this, how as athletes, how can we n- understand what's at stake, realize that, yeah, Baseball is a you know a sport and it's fun, but it's also our job and, and in most cases our livelihood. With understanding all that, how can we get into those states of minds? Well, you're going to go under pressure. You're going to go back to what you practice. Mm-hmm. You're going to go back to your instincts. You're going to go back to what's wired in. Um, and so you want to make sure you're wiring in the, the right stuff. So that's why it's all about your practice routine. You want to put yourself you know, somehow into those states. The the example they used in that was the uh, second half of the, of the Patriots come back in the Super Bowl against the Falcons. Okay. You know, they were so far down. It was like, okay, there's no chance. And so just collectively as a team, they would say, okay, no panic or anything, you know, been there before and all like that. But we are now to that point where no more mistakes. We just got to go out and execute everything and put together a great drive. You know, and so um, they, they've got like a, and, and, it, and it all started from there, but they had like a third and 15 from the 10 yard line. They're in, they're in bad shape and, uh, and, and the Falcons of blitz and their, their kind of small um, running back 
you know, one of these kind of scatty type of guys. He just throws himself over, picks off this uh, this blitzing cornerback, gives Tom, a, you know, an extra beat to throw, hits the uh, seventeen yarder for the for the first down. They go down, they score the t- and and it and it kind of rolls and gets its own momentum from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the circumstance had made it had put them into a comfortable zone of saying okay everything's got to click you know and so of course the, the credit goes to Brady but it went just as much to that halfback who who picked up the uh, blitzing corner sure the little things well I I think you said it man where it's, it comes down to the quote like been there before right and I think that's why especially in the sports world there was so much of an uh, importance and a demand for individuals that had experience right and um and that goes with without saying like obviously every i feel like every championship team has those guys that maybe aren't the best players like aren't the best like physically gifted players but they have you know quote unquote experience so it brings a whole new level of you know the dynamic but i think in today's baseball world you're seeing all these young bucks man coming up there and and getting it done now do you credit that to the advance in training for these young guys going up and and being able to make an impact and win world series like kind of you know the astros well you'd have to think that anybody young can like think of of correa with, with with the Astros. Well, yeah. he's played high level youth baseball, right? He was at a Puerto Rican. You said you were going down to play winter yeah. ball in Puerto Rico. He was at Puerto Rican Academy for years, you know, five, five, six, seven years and playing on international teams and that sort of thing. So he's, he's played international competition before he got to his first spring training as an 18 year old with the Astros. He'd, he'd already played uh, you know, international competition. So that, that probably has a lot to do with it, that type of experience you're talking about. I think these young guys are coming up and they've got a lot of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to me, man, it, it just makes so much sense to, cause I'm, I'm big into like visualization and, and essentially putting, utilizing your mind's power, um, to put yourself in a situation and being able to see yourself succeed. So obviously it's just visualization drills, but kind of going into a little more detail there. And I think that's why there's so much, oh man, there's so much goodness that comes out of this game sense stuff because you're able to do that on a different level. Like you're able to actually visualize it with, you know, I don't know what word I would use there, but you're able to like really see it on a screen and just the more reps you take, the more reps, it's like a comfort factor, right? And um, you're just you're just able to essentially go out there and be like, I've done this before, but you really haven't. So can you talk about like the importance of that for the, the like the youth athletes that are listening to this? Sure. What you're trying to put together, it, like in the in the app, you see where the pitch is cut a, off at a third. You make your guess as to what it is. It tells you whether you were right or wrong, and your mind likes that. <laughs> You get a little reward if you get it right, you know. <laughs> and um, hey, the the brilliant brat in our mind. Sometimes I call that the brilliant brat. You know, this the part of your brain that you really can't tell what to do, yeah. and yet you absolutely rely on it in order to succeed in these type of fast action things. But anyway, you get the guess, and then you hit the replay, and you see the whole pitch all the way in. You see the whole shape of the pitch, and so you're letting your mind work on. Here's what I see out of hand. Here's the shape of the pitch. Out of hand, shape of the pitch. Out of hand, at the plate. Here, out of hand. Here's what I see, so that you get you're building up the skill. Now, when you go in the game, you're not going to see that guy. Yeah. You know, there's 20 pitchers on it, and they're doubled over, you know, left and right. So there's actually 40, but you're not going to see that guy. Um, and so that's where that visualization comes in. So that you're taking a snapshot. You're not just thinking about this. You don't have to think it through, but you get so that you are you're taking that snapshot from the first pitch. And uh, whether that's a guy stepping out or whether that's in the on deck circle next time up or even in the in the dugout, you know, you're running that visualization you're talking about because you're really that's what actually what we're doing is training, training, especially that young hitters uh, eyes and brain and our eyes and brains are a lot faster, a lot smarter than we are, you know, just let them work on it. And uh, so, you know, you've kind of gotten used to building up that database, building up that database. And I think, you know, we want to look when you say experience does these things, we, we want to break that down and say, OK, that's fine. That's not enough. What exactly is it that experience gives you? Mm-hmm. Well, you've seen you've seen thousands of pitches. OK, sure. You know what the pitches do, you know how they move. So we're just seeing if we can multiply that mental database. 
multiply it tenfold. You know, so that if somebody's doing that app, they can be they can be seeing 500 pitches a week, uh, and 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 every one of them you're making a judgment on. You're not just kind of watching it. You've got to you've got to interact on it. You get it right. You get it wrong. Here's the replay, and so you know a guy does that five ten minutes a day, five days a week. You're going to end up with 500 pitches a month that you're looking at. Yeah, and you're just crushed. Like you said, I think you made a good correlation to like database, right? Like. I mean, I feel like every kid now knows how like hard drives and knows how memory and gigabytes work. I mean, the, correlated to that, right? Like the more you put into it, like the more you store up in this hard drive and you're able to put it to use. Right. Um, but ultimately, it does come down to a, a visualization. I remember reading in uh, Harvey Dorfman, great uh, sports psychologist, baseball in particular. And uh, he he had a book and he's talking about Willie Stargell from the Pirates, and how he would just—he he said he would lie in his uh, his um, his uh, hotel room the night before, and he would just visualize. Of course, you know they face the same guys over and over again. Yeah. You know what the guy would throw him, and so he'd just imagine all kinds of different at bats. Here's this pitch in here. So there's some of the confidence. You know, sometimes we think of visualization as kind of a psychological skills thing where you're building up your confidence. Oh, I'm picturing myself, uh, you know, destroying that ball in in. That's part of it, but what we're talking about is using visualization for the perceptual part of it. You're actually getting that practice, and they've got research that shows, you know, New, New York or something. You see that that uh, jazz player sitting there on the subway with his eyes closed, doing his finger fingering for the saxophone, mm-hmm. and they've put EEG on these people, and you know, not with an amateur, but you know, if you if you know those things, they prove you're getting the same value out of that practice as if you were playing your saxophone. How crazy is That's that? That's pretty too? remarkable. <laughs> now, we're not saying that you start out day one being able to do that. Right. But that guy sitting there, he's running those things. He's hearing it. He's hearing the rhythm section. He's knowing where to come in on that. And the guy's here, there's the comping piano. And it, that, that is 100% practice in there. So if we can set that kind of thing up, then then we're really getting after well, it. Well, then, then it goes, then it goes back to uh, trusting, right? We talked about trust a little earlier in the show about how, you know, Okay, I'll be honest, like I'm not going to sit here and like want to use my free time to you know, sit here, close my eyes and just like visualize pitching or whatever. Like I know that's a lot of the things that people, you know, it's it's not the exciting thing to do, right? It's not the thing that you can post on Instagram and get a bunch of views. It's not the the very socially accepted thing, but again, it goes back to being able to see what the data shows us, like what you just said, like it, it's almost replicating doing the exact act. So knowing that I think gives us a sense of belief and a confidence within a routine that we can establish uh, for optimal performance. That's right. But we're giving you a tool to do it. it right. it's, that's a pretty high end mental tool to do what you're talking about. Just sit there and visualize and making these things happen. So let's give you a tool and you get really good using that tool. And ultimately you get good enough using the tool. Like with the pro teams, we've got now guys who are going into their third year. They've advanced. We've got guys who are going to advance to double A next year who've been been doing this. And at some point they won't need it anymore because now it's become a habit of mind. Mm -hmm. Now they can visualize that guy. They can, they can stand in the on deck circle and know what the guy's throwing from there. So they don't, they don't need, you know, something that's, that's kind of doing that visualization for them. But that's how you pack it in. That's how you pack in those reps. Build that up. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think I think the reps thing is 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 very important too because I think we live in a society of instant gratification, right? So people mm-hmm. people go, okay, I'm going to do a set of ten minutes, and they do X amount of reps, and they're like, oh, I'm good. And I think there's a there's something to be said about the consistency of this specific tool, right? I mean, you you. What do you recommend for someone that's listening to this and goes, okay, I'm going to go to GameSenseSports.com. I'm getting a subscription. I'm getting the app. I'm going to do this. Now, what do you recommend for those individuals as far as how to be consistent, what that consistency should look like? Yeah, they had to do it about 10 minutes a day, not really any more than that, um, four or five days a week, just whenever you can fit that in. You know, it doesn't have to be a high intensity time. It can be it, it can be when you're driving in a car, not driving the car. But <laughs> <laughs> easy with that one. 
you know, and, and any anything like that, or you can find that. We had one of the guys on the on one of the pro teams that works with it said, uh, you know, one day he got his ten minutes in um, waiting for his hamburger at In and Out. <laughs> so you know you can find that and and I think that's a really modern way you know consider it interstitial training you know between the cells that those, those spaces between the cells or sometimes they talk about micro learning you know there's so much coming at us all the time and a, and a ball player so many things that you're working with and yet there are those moments where you can put in and you don't have to do the 10 minutes all at once do two drills two drills that's about three minutes they're about a minute and a half each get like 10 of these pitches and, and like that. So, you know, if you can find somewhere in your day where you can do a, a, a handful of these, that's, that's enough. In fact, you don't even want to do any more. I've had, I've had to like email coaches on some of the teams and saying, Hey, you got, you got a fella here who's like binging on this stuff you know, for 45 <laughs> minutes at a time. And that's, that's like doing the same lift for 45 minutes. It's not, you know, not what you want to, we've all been there. What you want to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to beat that. I'm going to get that next level. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's, that's, that's the thing about it. it it's the regularity and the, the way we're learning really. And with virtual reality and augmented reality, we're really going back to the basics of drill and practice, repetition, instant feedback and progressive difficulty. And, and you can build incredible skills you know, it's when his name Buka didn't go out one day and decide he was going to pole vault 18 feet. Yeah. You know? uh, repetition, instant feedback, and progressive difficulty. You can really build those skills up. That and same. I mean, you say, well, how's that different from weightlifting or technical work? It's not. not. Same thing. Yeah. We're just redirecting the. We're just targeting something that in the past people have said, well, you can't teach that. It comes with a experience or b talent. And we're saying, okay, okay, okay. Fine. Some guys are stronger than others, but anybody can get in the weight room and make themselves a lot better than where they were before. You may never catch up with that country strong guy, but you can make yourself a lot better than you were before. And maybe it becomes a difference maker in your level of play. The sixth tool, right? Yeah. Hope so. <laughs> I want to. So is there any way to track progression like for you with your, uh, you know, with your baby like here? Are you able to kind of get the feedback and see the success rates that you're having with athletes that are utilizing your program? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's one of the main reasons for doing it on the, on the computer is so that you can track it. So you can, you can track your own progression and you can see how you do against sliders and changeups and everything as you go along with it. And uh, a coach or an instructor in a facility also can track that with everybody. So first of all, like in, in college, they can have kind of non-contact time and all, you know, guys are doing it on their own, but, Coach can recognize and reward those who are, are doing it a lot. Shows you're working on the thing, so you you track performance within the app, and then um, when when we have the opportunity, when we have one of the college teams or now a pro team where they're using this with some some consistency over some time, then you can see some some actual uh, effect on the on the performance stats. So we did this with uh, for a year with these minor leaguers and. We had a test that we ran on them. So the, te the test, the video test, is pretty much the same approach as the, um, as the training with the cutoff videos. And so there was a really high correlation between guys' scores on this test after they'd been training for a whole season and their slugging percentage and their on-base percentage from that season. And the thing that I kind of – was kind of an eye-opener on that was you kind of expected the on-base percentage. Okay, we're – we're, we're, you know, guys are developing a good eye. Right. But I really like the notion of you, you're working on that and, and it can affect your slugging percentage. Yeah. It's like a culmination of everything, right? Comfort at the plate means the world. <laughs> um, well, and we think of somebody like uh, Donaldson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's, he, he's, it, it took him a while to hit his stride as a, as a pro, but he, he's not a huge guy. He's got a lot. He's got a lot of action that, that goes into his swing. Um, you know, he's really got to get to where he's reading that pitch early in order to unwind that, that leg kick and the, and the hand turn, and, you know, everything that he does. Right. So right. once his mental database was built up enough and he really knew what those pitches were, then the whole thing could work for him. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's a, it's a culmination of everything, right? Like, I mean, we, we have all of these tools and I think it's, it, it can be dangerous sometimes with kids, because they see all these things almost as like a have to do rather than like being able to get to do it to improve their game. Um, 
but again, like it, it's all these tools that we are able to to utilize to perform optimally and really, you know, advance in in the game. Um, I want to. One last question is like, what is the the verbal feedback that you get from like players? Like, what are some of the things that they're saying about it? <laughs> well, actually, one of my favorite ones on that was that this is when we were working the initial work with a, a college, Southeast Missouri, and a hitting coach there, Dylan Lawson, who's um, with the Astros now. But at some point, um, uh, the sports writer from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch comes down there, near Cape Girardeau, um, Missouri, mm-hmm. and is uh, trying to talk to the players, and, oh, we've got this revolutionary thing going on, and, you know, what, what are you doing with this revolutionary thing you're doing with the pitch recognition and guys would just look at him and go, um, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, weren't you doing something with video? Oh, yeah, 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 we do that. You know, out in the bullpen, yeah, 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 we do that. It had become so much a part of their every day that they didn't even think about it. Right. And what you're trying to get to. That's what you're trying to, We're not trying to knock people's socks off. So uh, it's uh, that's that's an important feedback. Another thing that... that um, that I got some feedback from the hitting coordinator for this uh, pro team. And this was before we'd done the, um, b- before we'd done the stats and the analysis on our, our training period with them. Uh-huh. And he said, and uh, he didn't really care whether it showed that it affected their hitting or not, that he was bought in on it because of the way guys were talking about it. Mm-hmm. That he had guys at, at, um, at, at low A in the rookie leagues talking like they were in, in, in triple A. Um, about you know what that pitcher is doing to you and the communication with the coaches and the communication back and forth between the hitters and really just a, a way and a language to to talk about what you guys holding the ball out there on the mound are trying to do to them and that's that's what a lot of it is you know really really thinking through that in a really natural kind of way yeah and I mean that breeds that just breeds success I feel yeah, like that, at least. that feedback means more to me than oh somebody went from hitting. Uh, 280 to 340. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that could affect that. You know, I, I, when when people are saying, "Oh, we did this and it had this effect," it's like I I really get upset with um, with either bad research or people pretending that you know, it's, okay, we're reporting that. What about the guy who went the other way? Yeah. You know, are you covering the whole bunch of people within that? So it's it's very challenging to put research out there that people can believe, but I'll tell you what you can believe is peer review scientific research. And that's what this, that's what this video occlusion method has gone through. Not just my stuff. I'm saying that's what that you to trust the method much more than like virtual reality or some of these things that seem a lot more uh, sophisticated. So that is a process that you can, you can trust because that's extremely rigorous. There's a lot of stuff out there that, that when people say, Oh, does this work? I don't know. I don't even think that's the right question. I don't. I don't like in that kind of research anymore to say, "Well, prove it works." Yeah, to some extent, you've got to trust, believe that. Look, look at uh, some of those those things like the research base or people who are using it, and then you look at how does it work best. What are the what are the conditions? And that's that's what we're we're learning with now. And it work, for instance, it works a lot better if you put in some of these live drills like the bullpen stand in, than if you just like do the computer thing and just do that by itself. Well, yeah, I think I think another responsibility that an athlete would have is is, I mean, yeah, you can ask all the questions you want, but I mean, everyone's different within their approach too, right? I mean, some guys probably, some guys will probably. I, I just know from being there in in May with the minors, some guys were checked out mentally and they didn't want anything to do with it. They got the iPad and they were kind of just like, yeah, whatever. But then some guys were like into it, right? So it comes back to you know, being, uh, like everyone having their different kind of approach and everyone being different. Um, so if you're an athlete, it's your responsibility to be like, okay, like, let me give this a shot. Let me do it for a month. See what we get, see what the results look like and not really relying on, you know, yeah, you want to rely on obviously the research and what the data is showing us. But again, you know, it's very personable. Everyone can, can respond to it differently. That's right. You got to trust the data enough to give it a really good try, exactly as you described. And then what's important is what's it doing for you? Not just for your outcome, not just for your product, but your process. What is it doing for you? You feel up, up there with what you're doing. Oh, yeah, that's huge, man. Well, Doc, I want to be uh, 
I want to be respectful of your time, man. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and let you go. But uh, before I do that, where uh, where can people find you? Do you have like a Twitter or an Instagram? Are you are you socially networking? I guess no, kind of. I've got yeah, I've got a Twitter that's um, Peter Fatty at Doctor Fatty. But the thing to look for is hashtag pitch recognition. So okay. two or three times a week, I find a story. That's about somebody who's making it or not making it. Maybe like a snow with the twins struggling and having to go back to low minors. Sure. You know, because of this issue. So it's hashtag pitch recognition. So if you look at that, you're going to get like 90% of it would be my things. It's not my thoughts. I'm just forwarding stories. People are writing about it. So on Twitter, that's the only one of those that I kind of do. But I do a lot of, of uh, the Twitter and uh, check hashtag pitch recognition. Okay. I've got the um, six tool ebook on Amazon, you know, so that's a modest like five bucks or something. Pretty easy, easy read on that if people like ebooks. So they've got videos in them of certain drills. And um, the Game Sense Sports, which is the company. Yep. Uh, and then also Peter Fatty, just as one thing, um, dot com, which is like professional website. And so there you can see research papers behind some of what we're talking about. And, presentations at, at various places and that kind of thing okay uh so what i will do i will link everything you just gave me into the show notes i will link the books that we've talked about um we'll link your ebook i will get everything taken care of in the show notes and uh so for those of you who are listening go ahead and go check those out um if you're interested in any of the things we've talked about but uh peter uh thank you so much for your time man um and uh, I will sign you off off the air. But thanks again for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. May the flow be with you. <laughs> All right, guys. That's another episode of The Robbie Rowe Show. Do me a favor. If you liked the episode or even if you didn't like it, go ahead and leave me a review on whatever platform you're listening to. Not only does it help me out um, with popularity on my show, but it also helps me out as a host of this podcast um, sometimes I don't know if I'm getting better or if I'm getting worse and I need to, I need y'all's opinion. So, uh, go ahead and leave a review and let me know what you thought. So again, thank you so much. Um, appreciate you guys tuning in until next time. Robbie Rowland, the Robbie Rowe show. Your boys out later. 